Warning. Uncharted planet detected. Scanning. Scanning. Warning. Life form detected. Life form identified. Matthew Strange of Mongoose Publishing. Incoming transmission. Greetings, travelers, and welcome to Traveler RPG Headquarters. You can find our Facebook group by searching our name in the Facebook search tool or find a link in the video description below. Thank you for participating in our third annual May Day, May Day Traveler Day event. It's a day we celebrate Traveler and all its offshoots for all the fun times it's given us over the years and um, salute to its uh, future endeavors. I'm your host, Frank Zuccardi, also known as Cyborg Prime, and today I'm happy to introduce Mr. Matthew Sprange of Mongoose Publishing. Welcome, Matthew. Good evening. Thank you for having me. How are you doing today? Uh, pretty good. Just uh, at the end of the uh, working day, so I'm um, just starting to relax. Oh, good, good, good. Well, I won't keep you long, but I do appreciate that you are sitting for an interview with us. Um, uh, I love Traveler. I've been playing it since I was a kid, and... Um, uh, I love to um, talk about it and promote it however I can. So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, sit with me for this uh, May Day interview. You're welcome. It means a lot. Thank you. Why don't you, uh, for folks who uh, don't know you, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, how old are you and um, where are you from? Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm in my 40s um, and uh, I live in a town called Swindon, which is about 70 miles uh, west of London in the UK. Mongoose is uh, based there as well. And I think it's fair to say I've been uh, gaming most of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a, a favorite uh, sci-fi book or TV show or movie that uh, you remember from childhood that kind of really inspires you? Yeah, that's that's going to be Star Wars. It's, <laughs> it's all going to be Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. All right. What do you, what's, uh, tell us... What it, what it is about Star Wars that inspires you? That, well, that is a very big question. When Star Wars came out, I was about three and a half, four years old. And I can remember sitting in the Swindon cinema. We only had one back then. Uh, sitting in the Swindon cinema, and um, I remember seeing Stormtroopers come onto the um, uh, blockade runner right at the start. It's um, pretty much my earliest memory, and it never really went away. The the the, the, uh, the scene it's, where they it's, it's Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're talking about the scene where they uh, breach the wall and come onto the uh, Princess Leia ship. That's the one, yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think that was uh, my first uh, laser fight I ever saw too. I was I'm a little bit older than you, but it did leave an impression. Um, Star Wars is a great franchise. So, uh, anything else about uh, Star Wars? I mean, like, um, is is it the M you like the Empire, the government structure? Do you like the tech, the the future design, um, all that stuff? I mean, uh, uh, what is I it that it, really stands out to you? Yeah, possibly because it was um, almost always uh, more than just uh, the film, or more than just the uh, the original trilogy. You had uh, all the uh, toys going around with it. You had all the novels, and then, of course, time goes on. We get the uh, the prequel trilogy. There's um, uh, there was always so much more than just what you saw on the screen to Star Wars, which um, I think quite obviously resonates with um, uh, any any role player. So, so you think it's the um, the extensive lore? It's it's the way you can um, sink yourself sink yourself into it. You don't have to. Um, I'll give you a gaming example, actually. Okay. Um, something um, Games Workshop do very well with Warhammer is it's not just about playing Warhammer, it's talking about Warhammer, it's collecting it, painting it, figuring out army lists. You can um, get into the novels. You can, um, uh, you're can. you starting to see um, uh, uh, films and animations uh, come out for it now. It's, it's more than just what, it appears to be on the first place, and Star Wars is the same. You can, um, say, sink into the deep lore if you like, or you can, uh, um, as I did when I was like six or seven, create your own, um, uh, your very first miniatures game using Star Wars figures. There was, there's always different ways to enjoy it. I see what you're saying. Uh, you like the fact that there's, like you say, many different uh, ways to connect. Every, people can find many 
different ways. Like the way I find to connect to Star Wars may be different than how you find, but there's many different ways to interact and pathways to it. Oh, absolutely. Plus you get the uh, all the fights at school. I really liked um, Han Solo, but Luke Skywalker was always my boy. Yeah. Um, did you have, what was your favorite? Did you have Star Wars toys when you were younger? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I managed to get, well, I managed to persuade my parents to get a hold of the AT-AT, but... Um, uh, I never got, I never managed to convince them to pick up the Millennium Falcon, but uh, just down the road, Adam Archer had the Millennium Falcon, and I was really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, uh, a friend who collects uh, Legos, and I was always jealous of Star Wars Legos. My uh, my favorite toy was, I had a Boba Fett. That was, I think, uh, maybe maybe a Luke. Those were the extent of my... <laughs> Star Wars toys. <laughs> um, so, uh, do you have any uh, hobbies aside from gaming? Um, uh, over the past um, a few years, I have been uh, exceedingly busy, but um, um, I do um, scratch build and fly radio controlled aircraft. Um, in fact, in my garage at the moment, I've got a six foot wingspan um, Spitfire. With um, a uh, four-stroke engine, very, very nice, but uh, haven't had a chance to take it out, much less build anything new of late. Did you say that was a gas-powered plane? Uh, yeah, a uh, four-stroke engine. Oh, yeah. Wow. It got clipped. I heard, I heard that that time. Yeah, that's cool. Um, that's pretty big. <laughs> they get a lot bigger. <laughs> Do you have, is there a, a, a radio aircraft uh, club in your area that where you go fly it, or you just do it on your property, or how do you? Well, where, where I live, we used to have the very best, um, what was called the very best <clears throat> flying site in Europe. There's um, uh, an airfield on top, of a, on top of a hill, our old RAF airfield, um, the RAF Rotten. Um, but it, it never got used for anything. So we had the, the massive runways all to ourselves. And of course, there's no trees or anything nearby. Um, but then... Um, uh, the guys from um, uh, Clarkson and Co. from the Grand Tour Amazon series came over and took it over, and everyone got pushed out. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, though, to have be able to launch your, uh, your your plans from an actual airfield that has a history. That's awesome. Oh yeah, well, way better than um, taking off from grass, which always tends to uh, uh, trip models up, and you can do like more realistic takeoffs and landings, and what have you. How durable are those things if you have a hard landing? <laughs> yeah, it depends um, uh, exactly how they come down. If they uh, more or less come down on their wheels, um, yeah, you might be able to put them back together. But if they uh, go into the tarmac, nose down at full speed, yeah, that, that's obliterated. That's, that's probably the end of its flight life. <laughs> Uh, that's a cool hobby. Uh, I used to go with my uh, parents to go uh, watch people uh, do those uh, at a uh, um, radio-controlled airplane club. It was pretty cool when I was younger. Any other hobbies aside from that? Oh, uh, well, I do the boring ones. I could say I do a lot of reading, but that's not um, not really a hobby. I look after two uh, guinea pigs, and at some point I want to upgrade to a couple of cats. So I haven't got around to that yet. Guinea pigs, they're, they're nice. They're, they make pleasing sounds like tribbles. <laughs> yeah, I tell people they're uh, very masculine animals, but they, they don't always see that. <laughs> Yes, yeah, you don't look very evil petting, stroking a uh, you know <laughs> guinea pig in your lap. Oh, yes, send him to the airlock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so tell me about uh, how you uh, got into gaming. What was the first? Like, how did you find out about gaming when you were a kid? Uh, well, when we were in. Um... Uh, primary school, seven or eight years old or something like that. Um, the um, uh, game books were um, doing the uh, doing the rounds, like the old Fighting Fantasy and uh, Lone Wolf series. Mm -hmm. uh, we kicked off with those, and one day, purely by accident, uh, there was a teaching assistant in. He saw what we were reading, and he says, uh, stick around after school, I've got something that you want to see. And it turned out to be Tunnels and Trolls. So we uh, had a few sessions of that over the school holidays. I um, badgered my parents until they managed to track down a copy of the Redbox basic D&D. 
And that really was the start. From there, we went. I went to um, Judge Dredd. Then Traveller was the third game I got into. Um, got into the um, uh, Warhammer, uh, both Fantasy and 40K. And, uh, yeah, that, that kind of set me on my path, I think. Combination of all that. Did you have a favorite type of D and D character when you first played? Like a lot of people, like I always play a druid, and my friend always plays a thief. Not always, but you know, primarily, you just get to know like a class that you prefer, or that you know all the Ooh. stuff for. You know, which what was your yeah, favorite in thing? Those days, in those days, I was the one organizing everything, so um, I was almost permanently the, uh, the games master for whatever game we played. But um, over the years, uh, favorite class in D&D, I'd have to say, hands down, is the Paladin. What's your favorite aspect of that? Uh, the way that you can really annoy all the other players, but <laughs> only because you're doing the right thing all the time. And the Games Master loves you because uh, the presence of a Paladin makes the party very predictable. <laughs> no, no, we must release the prisoners. What? <laughs> No, we must keep the prisoners. <laughs> when you do the very first adventure where you're just like saving the villagers, the poor village from um, uh, a tribe of goblins or something, um, you get that point where the uh, villagers say, oh, we haven't got much, but we've managed to scavenge some uh, money together. And you just immediately stride forward before anybody else can speak. No, 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 you you keep your money. We don't need it. Every other party member is looking daggers at you. <laughs> Armor. The wizard needs all his ingredients for his uh, familiar. Uh, they can't realize because you're being a nice guy. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, you like to troll the other players with your paladin. Well, you do. Um, <laughs> they do get it um, paid well because whenever one of them's in trouble, no matter what is going on, the paladin's always the first to put themselves in between the enemy and them. Mm hmm. So it sounds like you spent a lot of time um, being the GM. A lot of uh, yeah, folks yeah. find themselves in that situation where, like, there wouldn't be a game unless somebody GM. So it might as well be you, right? Pretty much, yes. Um, and uh, I mean, at school, um, there were a couple of other people who did a pick up books and did run the occasional game, but. Um, I was always the one picking up all the books and um, trying to prompt people to play all the games. So, yeah, it, it came down to me. Like, how did you know you were hooked on games? Were you, like, spending all your allowance or, like, every time uh, you got some money for, you know, birthdays or whatever, straight to the game store you went? Um, well, um, during um, my later years in school, um, school teachers did try and... Um, uh, get my teachers to uh, take away all my books. That, that might have been a sign. <laughs> <laughs> he seems distracted. <laughs> well, it was. I did, to be honest, I think it was less a problem with the uh, the books and more a problem with um, uh, authority. But uh, yeah, what, what what are you going to do? Eh? Yeah, I hear you. All right. Well, cool. Um, and and well, so are you trying to catch up on um, uh, playing more? Um, since you've been GMing all that time, or are you just fine being the GM? I'm I'm fine with that. I'll I'll play. I'll GM. Um, I'm probably a better GM than I am a player. If if, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. So well, you started out with uh, your tunnels and trolls, and went on to D and D and stuff, and um, Warhammer, and uh, ended up in in Traveler. Uh, what? Tell me about your first time playing Traveler. Like, how did you hear about Traveler? I honestly couldn't tell you. I mean, in those days, there was no internet, so <clears throat> it more or less came down to whatever was in um, the local game store at the time. Um, I don't know what drew me to Traveller at all. Um, I do remember there was um, uh, there was a paperback book in, um, I'm going to say in the UK, it might have made it to America, or it might have been an American book, um, called What is Dungeons & Dragons? Um, which basically describes what the game's all about. But it had a chapter talking about other games. I think I saw Traveller in the back of that. Um, so when I saw it in the store, it, it kind of clicked, and I picked it up because um, the only sci-fi gaming I've been doing was um, a little of the old GW's Judge Dredd game. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was in the state where I was picking up pretty much every game I possibly could get my hands on. 
Um, and uh, yeah, travel just seemed the uh, the obvious one. It was the um, the original starter set I picked up, the ones that came after the uh, the little black books. And then, uh, so you pretty much uh, did you follow along with like every edition that came out, and or did you just like no, finish? no, no, no? I never got into at the time. I'd never got into Mega Traveler. Never did um, uh, New Era. Um, T4 completely passed me by. Um, whenever um, I went back to Traveller, it was always um, uh, classic because I had the books and um, uh, I knew how to play it. Mm -hmm. I think I saw a Traveller in a hobby shop, and uh, I don't think the owner knew really much about it. Uh, it was the box set, and um, yeah, I was fascinated by it, but I didn't, I didn't get to play it for years. I was still a young kid then, and uh, I didn't really have, I just moved to this town, and I didn't really know anybody. Um, I didn't get to play Traveler until I was uh, maybe about uh, second year of high school. But man, what a great oh. game! I spent so many time, so much time like rolling sectors, and <laughs> so much time <laughs> filling notebooks. So, um, so, so you found Traveler and you started playing it, and uh, and so tell me, like, what did you spend all your time doing? Like, what what locked you into Traveler, playing like loving it so much? Um, it was a bit of everything. I mean, the first thing you start doing when you're just um, funny about the rules, you're rolling up characters. You're um, once you get hold of high guard, you're playing. Um, you're creating new ships. Um, I don't recall any big long campaigns we did back then um, for Traveller. Um, it was mostly with um, quite small groups, just uh, two, two or three players. Um, um, I'm trying to remember if we ever brought it to our main Friday night games. I don't think we did. D&D uh, &D was pretty solid uh, back then. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what would you say, like, do you, do you like to make characters mostly, or do you like planets, or do you, like, as far as the, the, the like, random mechanics, you know, that make up the GM part of the game? What's your favorite, with, like... Yeah, th these days it's all about the, um, uh, it's all about the actual story that uh, layers on uh, on top of all that um i mean there is a reason you've seen um are still a lot more adventures and uh, in particular a lot more grand epic campaigns for traveler over the uh, over the past few years now when you um when you set out to do a project like that do you randomly generate a subsector or a sector or do you uh, and then or do you like kind of go back and fudge it in areas where you want things to be, or do you just go with how it randomly played out? Um, well, when I'm actually playing the game, it's um, almost always in uh, the official charted space setting, but the way, the way that's set up is while um, just about every system has its main world detailed, um, you've always made sure that there's um, enough room for referees to uh, ins insert their own worlds um, within a, a star system. So if you do need that um, Dust Bowl planet um, with a certain tech level and government uh, right in front of the, uh, the players, you can do that no matter where you are on sector map. Um, you just say it's not the, uh, the main world. So, um, all right. Well, uh, tell me about, uh, like, if you were a Traveler character, uh, what would you say your three background skills are, the ones you get before you uh, go <laughs> off on your <laughs> adventure as an adult? Well, um, by the time I was 18, um, uh, I think I could claim Art Zero, but um, only for writing, nothing to do with drawing or painting. I have no terms in that direction at all. Um, uh, I, you know, I'd also claim um, Flight Zero, given all the um, thousands of hours I spent on flight sims as uh, as a teenager. All right. I'd also kid myself that um, uh, I could, uh, by the time I was 18, I could um, say that I had Flight Zero as well, but I was probably still unskilled at that point. <laughs> all right. And uh, that, what... <laughs> um... Have you ever thought about what your personal uh, characteristics are? No, no, that would be too embarrassing. 
<laughs> All right, everyone else got one. Across the board, how's that? <laughs> I'm just seven, just the average guy. Um, yeah, uh, did you ever uh, attend university or join the military? Um, I did go for um, two interviews with the uh, RAF uh, before I was 20. Mm -hmm. um, during the course of those, I came to realize that while I probably was the world's greatest fighter pilot in making, I'd make an absolutely lousy officer. And unfortunately, in the RAF, you have to be both. Um, I didn't go to university after school, but um, I have, um, uh, I'm doing a, a, in the middle of a degree at the moment. Mm, all right. Um, all right, so um, what's your favorite uh, traveler career and why? <laughs> uh, noble with the dilettante assignment. Um, I just like the idea of creating an absolutely worthless human being and then just throwing them out into the galaxy and seeing what happens. Uh, do you like to have a, a, an entourage for your noble or you just like to go it alone? Yeah, that, that That'll be the other players, whether they um, know oh, that or not. All right, they're your entourage, whether they like it or not. Basically, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm paying for everything anyway, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, of course. So, um, all right, do you have a, an all-time favorite story about something that happened in Traveler Game? Like a, no crap, there I was. <laughs> um, the first thing that springs to mind is um, one of the times we ran the um, Belt Strike campaign um our uh, the mongoose first edition one um the party party of four there's two of them that are real blue collar workers so one of them had um a social um score of two the other one five and um they were real die hard engineer mechanic belter kind of feel which is exactly what the campaign needs the other two both chose to be noble dilettantes um which immediately created a, a divide in the party. The uh, nobles were trying to compete with each other whenever they went on leave to throw the biggest party. And in one night, they were spending more than the other two earned in an entire year. Um, but uh, the blue collars got their own back. Um, they managed to get one of the nobles uh, addicted to uh, certain drugs and became a supplier. Um, wildly overcharging. Not that he mind me; had more money than sense anyway. The stuff characters the players get up to. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Uh, we have a, uh, a a doctor in our game who does questionable things. Yes. Uh, it's uh, that's one of the cool things I like about travelers. Just it gives. Um, there's no like alignment necessarily, but people kind of develop their own alignment, if you will, and uh, it's it. it Varies. <laughs> well, I remember seeing, um, um, you know, those motivational graphics you get on um, get on the internet. There was a bunch done for games, um, and one I printed out. And it's still stuck on our wall at the moment. It's a picture of um, a sleeping polar bear, and climbing on its back is a penguin with a pair of symbols. And the caption: Player characters. Just when you thought the uh, evening was going to be uh, boring. <laughs> Yes, they do uh, send things in unexpected ways. So let's say uh, you meet a, a a new traveler player, somebody who's brand new to the um, hobby and brand new to traveler universe. Um, what kind of advice would you give a brand new traveler? Well, this happened to us uh, about eighteen months ago. We had um, um, a new person join Mongoose, um, Cassie, as a graphic designer. She'd um, she was a gamer in the sense that um, uh, she played a lot on um, uh, PlayStation and so forth. But not only was this her first um, exposure to Traveller, it was her first exposure to role-playing games. Um, uh, and every Friday afternoon um, at Mongoose, or at least we did before the lockdown, we uh, down tools and um, uh, play games. Um, figure if you're going to make games, you were... Um, uh, play them as well um so we kicked her off with uh traveler um that's for advice that just threw her uh, right into it within two minutes of actual play after the character creation um yeah she was she was well into it <laughs> so yeah it's, it's simple enough just throw people in at the deep end don't worry about 
um, the rules any further than rolling two dice, adding modifiers and trying to get above eight. Um, don't worry about whether your character is um, uh, powerful enough because it really doesn't matter in Traveller. Um, and just uh, just start exploring the stars, see where it goes. What, what should a new what should a new player do if they roll like a three or something, or if they get like damaged in, uh, in you know uh, in, injured during character combat? Should they throw that character exactly, away and start over? No, this is exactly what happened to Cassie. She for her physical stats, if I can remember, she had what was it, strength two, dex three, endurance three. And I'm looking at this thinking, yeah, we really got to re-roll that. But we were we're actually going to play the uh, belt strike campaign again. It's um, uh, this was a different group to the one I just just described. Um, but there's a as she was rolling up, going through her turns, she kept hitting life events where she was getting the result that um, uh, whole whole years were missing from her life that she couldn't remember. Um, and in the Belt Strike campaign, there's uh, an alien artifact, and I thought that is just too perfect. So um, uh, the players, the other players, were well aware of how weak she was. So they were trying to guide her through, and um, hoping nothing more than a, a stiff breeze hit her, because otherwise she was going to be in trouble. <laughs> um, I think the life event uh, mechanic is a great, um, a great, great thing. Um, I really, really like it. It really um, adds. Um, an aspect, you know, uh, a variable aspect to the characters that uh, it makes them more random and different from each other, and uh, and, and gives you more cohesive, um, you know, background story that you know wasn't really there before. Um, I think it's a great, a great addition to the game. Uh, I like I like to when my players are like, well, how can I figure this into like what my little story is about my character, and then they start going off on this creative thing about you know, how this life event actually happened or whatever. Um, you know, Absolutely. Oh. I mean, the whole point was to not just create um, a bunch of stats and skills, but um, end up with a fully rounded character that's uh, not only got a history, um, not only has a whole bunch of people out there in the forms of contacts and enemies and allies and what have you, to interact with, but they've also already got a history with the other players. So you're not just starting every campaign with, okay, you will meet at the Starport Bar. You're you're ready to go. Um, I always likened it to um, creating the crew from Firefly, where they've you already have people who have got links to each other. They're already a, a cohesive unit. That was another aspect I was going to say that I appreciate because um, it's. Also cool. Uh, I like the creative process, and so when the, when the players are going, "Hey, maybe my guy met your guy when I was at university, and I was on the, you know, this happened to me, and look, that happened to you, and those things can be connected." Um, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. You know, they're coming. Even people who've never played um, a role playing game before uh, start coming up with you know these stories about how they're. They're connected and coming up with this whole like imaginary, um, you know, backstory that relates their friends in there. You know, and then maybe you did something and we had to come rescue you, and that's why you know. And then we got hurt, you know, on the way out or whatever. I mean, it's like it's just great. We don't want to say like background adventure seed things um, that really yeah. um, uh, like fuel people's imagination. It's really awesome. Um. So let's see uh, what and okay. So that's your that's your uh, advice for, for new traveler players. What about for new um, traveler referees? Uh, what's your advice for them? Mm, possibly um, pretty much with the uh, same as um, you do for D and D. You don't try and um, introduce a whole empire at once. You start with a small village with. Um, uh, traveler, start with um, uh, a single world and only expand from there when you're ready. Good advice. So um, you have a giant um, history of uh, Traveler from uh, classic until now. Um, if somebody wants to get into playing Traveler, what's the quintessential uh, starter pack um, that gives it's players and refs everything they need to, to start playing? 
uh, the core rule book and um, a single uh, a single adventure will be enough to get you off. Um, probably recommend uh, March's Adventure One High and Dry. Um, it's designed for a starting party. Um, it's not. I was going to say it's not overly dangerous. There's a massive a volcano exploding at the end of it. Um, but there's no, um, there's very little direct combat, so it gives a chance for everyone to uh, uh, bed down and see what the universe is like. That's cool. I saw in the catalog there's actually like a traveler starter kit. What comes in that? Not, um, not in print um, anymore. Oh, we're we're looking to bring. Um, um, we might revise the uh, starter box set a little later this year. We're going to have. Um, uh kind of like a 64 age um starter pack um it, it really won't be the full set of rules but it'll be enough to uh get you exploring uh, uncharted space um but no the um the core rule book is the main entry point at the moment all right so core rule book and an adventure and then it's the thing that another thing i like about traveler is it just uses regular six-sided dice which you can like get out of any monopoly game or, or go down to the store, the, the drugstore, and uh, buy. I mean, I see them at Walmart everywhere. Um, oh yeah, I mean that's that's intentional. There's, um, we don't like, I don't like um, putting gimmicky things in games. And while there are solid reasons for going to other dice systems, um, I do have the feeling that you should only do that if there is. If you do have that solid reason, we don't use um, uh, different polygon dice uh, simply because they're there. So, I mean, D and D is the uh, the original and um, uh, implemented them um, uh, very very well. Um, but Traveler just doesn't need it at all. Yeah, that's uh, so, uh, you know, it's like, hey, you want to play Traveler? Yeah, you got some dice and a pencil and a paper, and I got these three books. Let's go. Um, you know, it's pretty uh, easy, what I want to say, easy pickup. You're playing, you're sitting down to play, and you have a new player, and they're like, I don't know what to buy out of the book. Like, what do I even need? Where do I start? What should I What should I buy? Do you have, like, a uh, starter kit of, um, like, inventory items that you would recommend um, all Traveler players should have a basic set of? <laughs> well, on, on the one side... Um... Uh, just through the creation process, you're likely to pick up uh, a few bits and pieces. But the one, absolutely the one thing I always remind players to get is a uh, communications device, um, effectively a mobile phone. Because um, so many times players go wandering off um, and that can be exceedingly dangerous in travel. For God's sake, have the ability to talk to one another. So a long range communicator. Just a mobile phone. That's all they need. Just some way to talk to each other when they're not in direct line of sight. That, that's all. <laughs> what if they're on a uh, What if they're on a uh, uncivilized planet? Uh, like you want something that's like a walkie-talkie. Uh, um, I imagine like high-tech phones would also have walkie-talkie capabilities. Uh, pr pretty much, yes. Um, you, you can think of it as like a vast expanded um, Bluetooth communication system or such like. Um, but on a technological world, you've got a basic comms device you can plug into um, their equivalent of the internet and talk to anyone on the planet. If you're not, um, just something that can uh, transmit uh, 20 or 30 kilometers, that's that's all you need to survive. In my game, we uh, just make sure that they uh, can communicate back to the ship. The ship is like the hub, of, you know, they go away from the ship. They can go pretty far in different directions, but not too far. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that always gives some interesting things like i don't know something's jamming your communications <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you better go back to the ship <laughs> or maybe you're wandering too far i don't know uh, yeah that's uh that's good uh good advice um and uh all right so tell me about uh how you became a content creator for traveler like when what took you what were your first steps into the um creation of traveler you know content did you write uh, tas articles or um... no um among us we all we have a rule that whenever we um bring out a, a new game it's always got to be something that at least one pers person at mongoose is has a real passion for 
Um, we don't just we don't do games simply because we think they can sell well. They've they've got to have um, uh, an emotional hook for us. Um, and we'd um, been doing um, a little run of uh, games that we'd um, that we played when we were uh, teenagers, when we were kids. Um, and um, started investigating whether um, licenses were available for them. Paranoia was um, uh, the other one, but uh, uh, no, with a traveler, we tracked down Mr. Miller, gave him a, a phone call and say, can we give you some money and we'll, we'll produce a new edition of Traveler for you? And uh, he, he said yes. You just cold called him like that? Basically, yeah, that's what it amounted to. <laughs> hey, let's... What game do you wish you could do? Traveler? Okay, let's see. That's pretty awesome. Um, um but no, the things like that happen. Um we did the um a little before Traveler, we did um a new Conan role playing game. And that was a license that really just fell into our laps. We were uh, talking to a company about something completely different. Uh and they literally said to us, "Hey, do you guys want to do Conan?" My business partner at the time turned to me and says, do we want to do Conan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Yeah, that's great. So so what was your first uh, project that you worked on? Like, What types of things did you produce uh, when you first started? You know, Did you just start Sorry. with like a whole new core rule set, or did you rewrite some other things first to get the hang of it? Or... Well, probably, you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, we started off with, um, uh, with a, a core book for what is now our first edition. Um, but we made, um, because we'd always been playing um, classic Traveller uh, in the past, um, we naturally rooted um, our own edition of the game uh, on that core set. And we it up and uh, brought it a bit more into the uh, 21st century. Um, but uh, we still remained very close to the um, core principles of Classic Traveller to the extent that um, ships aside, and you can simply substitute um, one of our Type S scouts for, um, uh, for, for one of the Classic ones, you can pick up a Classic uh, Adventure, that like Death Station or... Um, uh, shadows or whatever, and run it using our own traveler system, uh, doing the co conversion on the fly. Um, I mean, the uh, the way numbers are handled is a bit different, but the input and output is exactly the same. Um, so you, know, you can just look at some um, stat lines for weapons and the damage makes sense. Uh, the skills are very similar. Um, so yeah, it's um, yeah, we started with classic and moved on from there. And it's funny that you should mention Death Station because that's exactly what I did with my new group of traveler players. That was their first adventure I ran them through, um, and with the uh, mongoose rules. And uh, but I had you know I have a big stack. I've been following Traveler since classic, so I have a little bit of every edition so it's like hey i'll just bust this out and see how it runs it's always you know death station's a classic so and uh man they really enjoyed it and uh, and for me as the gm it was a breeze to just like you say do the conversion on the fly the the changes are so minor they're barely noticeable it's just really easy to did a brilliant job on that oh indeed yes so after that you after you created the new uh, core rules, what was your uh, next uh, uh, thing that you wanted to tackle? It was all about hitting the um, all the main bases. So we needed a, an equipment book, so we do central supply catalog, high guard, obviously, we uh, had to bring along. Um, and then we started examining the um, each of the careers and kind of do um, expanded career books for each of the uh, main archetypes and traveler. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, it just kind of um, uh, spiraled outwards. And um, let's see, uh, you also uh, revived the uh, Journal of the Traveler's Aid Society. I, noticed. Um, I saw a bunch of uh, back issues on uh, drive-through RPG that were 
uh, inexpensive. And then I then I saw that there was uh, those five or six editions of the um, of the revival. How, how did that go? Yeah, we got. Yeah, we did that as a, a Kickstarter. I mean, the original intent was to have just three volumes and um, have original material in there, but also go back to the uh, the classic journals and. Um, revise, enhance, and sometimes uh, completely rewrite um, articles from way back when and bring them to the modern edition. But as we were working on it, we realized the journals were useful for uh, useful for something else. We brought out the Traveler Companion um, a little before, before that, uh, which is basically um, a toolkit for uh, different rules. So if you're running a game in a very different uh, type of universe to charted space, or you just want to try things um, uh, in a different fashion, you can just pick and choose from these rules and um, uh, apply them to your game. We realized the journal was the perfect um, system to do pretty much that, but for in-universe charted space um, articles. So uh, it gives us a chance to explore different areas of charted space and um, uh, kind of play around with ideas before we think about uh, whether we're going to bring them into um, a more mainstream supplement. Um, uh, but it's also a vehicle whereby uh, if we've just got um, a single page covering a new type of weapon, we might be waiting a long, long time to get the um, appropriate um, hardback supplement that we can put that in, or we can just simply put it into um, uh, a journal, um, volume in the journals, and it's um, ready there for people to try out without uh, having to wait for it. So if a person uh, wanted to uh, contribute to uh, the Traveler's uh, journal or, or get any kind of like uh, Traveler writing credentials, how did they go about doing that? And they, well, they, they do, write articles and submit them, or uh... yeah, I mean, there's there's different ways of doing this. Um, I mean, we do have an open call for um, journal articles uh, right now. People can see that um, uh, see the details of how to do that on our uh, the forums on our website. Okay, um, and if they wanted to go deeper into it. Um, if we see a writer does have some real talent, we might go back to them and say, do you want to do a few more articles? And uh, uh, if they um, keep turning out good work, we might go back to them and say, well, do you want to do like um, a proper 32 page adventure? And from there spiraling upwards to um, uh, possibly some of the uh, heavyweight um, uh, travel books that we do. Um, there's a chap called uh, Christopher, Christopher Griffin who's now one of our, um, I think it's fair to say, one of our main frontline um, writers for Traveller. He started off doing journal articles and went to um, uh, the two-page adventures, the, uh, what was it, Reach Adventure 6, I think it is, Exodus, that's um, one of his. And um, right now he's just finished doing a book called The Third Imperium, which will be the central setting pillar for charted space. Um, on the thing about other ways to do it, um, what you don't do is um, approach us saying, um, hey, I've got uh, a complete book written here, do you want to publish it? Because um, the answer is invariably going to be no, and it's a lot of wasted work. But that said, one of our other um, uh, new entrants to um, um, the pillars of the traveling right the writing community uh chat called gear um approached us saying i've this is my spare time i've written up a complete sector uh you want to take a look at it and um you immediately start thinking well this this is not going to be um quite what we're looking for i read through his work and it was absolutely first class so uh, I said to him, I tell you what, you write uh, uh, another sector next to it, and uh, we'll we'll publish that book. And uh, so he's joined uh, our ranks now, and he's currently working on the robot handbook, which uh, I suspect will be um, uh, another foundation for the uh, the core rulebook series. Fantastic! I have my copy right here on my desk. 
sometimes sometimes it works <laughs> i was thinking about you know um i like to make uh traveler utility programs and so i was like hmm, how about a robot builder so i had the robot book out and was gonna look through that and see about doing that um yeah but uh maybe i'll wait for the new robot edition <laughs> why do it twice I mean, the, the other um, path to writing Traveller stuff is on um, Drive Through RPG. We've got the uh, PAS program, which basically states that um, you can draw upon anything that um, Mongoose is doing for uh, Traveller. So um, you're not limited to like um, just your own setting or skirting around the edges of charted space. You can write a, I don't know, a complete description of um, the Imperial Palace um, and publish that and um, uh, make a few pennies out of it as well. I see. Um, we basically opened up Chartered Space and the Traveller system to whatever people want to do um, with, our, with our blessing. Um, I saw that on Draft Through RPG, but I wasn't sure of all the details of how it worked exactly. Um, if, you, if you click on the um, as program button on um, Travel, it's part of their, um, what do they call it, community creator program on DriveThru. Um, it basically means you can write your own material, um, distribute it to other people, and have them um, um, pay you some money for it. Cool. Like, let's, um, say, let's say if I came up with a new, um, I don't know, ship design, and I, I wrote, like, a, I don't know, a 10-page booklet. Um, formatted old old school style um uh, would that be a venue for that for instance oh absolutely yes there's, there's people doing um similar things right now um and from there you can treat it as um uh just another aspect of uh, of your hobby and why not um there are some people who've managed to set up their own functioning businesses doing a material like this um alternatively get some um good hits on the taz program then um uh drop us a line say hey notice what i've been doing i should be doing this stuff for you and we'll talk about um uh you writing official traveler material i see that's uh that's really um open minded of you and uh, you know last year when i was talking to you um we were talking about the um uh your work environment at your office and uh, why don't you tell us some more about that because i found it very fascinating um you have a you have a uh, environment that is really conducive to uh keeping the creative um uh, flow oh yeah very much in fact we're um i think we're just about to um configure um uh, a fair portion of the uh, of the office um, basically, we Mongoose HQ is um, about 3,000 square foot, uh, divided into um, uh, two fairly large areas. On the one side, we've got a um, uh, massive uh, gaming area with, um, it's got at least a dozen six by four gaming tables um, for uh, miniature games, which the local gaming club comes over or came over before the virus. Uh, every Tuesday evening to um, uh, make use of. Um, we've also got all our um, uh, all our books for sale on uh, shelves there, which also doubles as a, a mail order area for um, uh, covering the UK, Europe, and uh, a few countries beyond. Um, moving into the uh, main area, um, about a quarter of it is an actual office, which is where. Uh, all the books get um, uh, put together on uh, on PCs, um, but we've also got um, uh, another gaming area with. Um, I managed to find a, a table big enough to play Talisman with all the expansions, which was the uh, criteria I was using to uh, find the table in the first place. <laughs> Um, but we've got um, uh, a big flat screen with uh, Xbox below it. Um, uh, and off hours, we uh, play games or watch films. Um, there are uh, models and toys and figurines absolutely everywhere throughout the office. Uh, it, it doesn't look like your normal place of work. <laughs> Do you find that that uh, helps uh, increase creativity and productivity? A lot of places um, 
have looked at towards that model of like you know uh, you, you you run into a mental block we'll go play with the you know hang out over here you can you know play with a rubik's cube or like you know some clay or like you know a uh, you know, play some video games or whatever, chill out for a little while and then get back to work once you've cleared your, uh, you know, your mental block or whatever. Yeah, I mean, we have joked about um, uh, creating a dedicated mood room. Um, but uh, no, it it's all stems from uh, a desire to create a place that's fun and interesting to work in. I, um, when we created Mongoose 20 odd years ago, one of the... Um, stipulations was um, people shouldn't dread coming to work in the morning. It should be an interesting place, a fun place where cool things happen. Um, if we manage to, uh, you know, pay the bills at the end of the month, well, that's... that's um, uh, Bonus. Uh, anything, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great philosophy. Um, Sounds like a great place to work. I hope so. I hope so. We try to... Um, make, we try to keep everyone happy. We, again... Pre-virus, um, we went out on um, semi-regular um, uh, office outings, which might be to the uh, Natural History Museum in um, London, or uh, I think the last one we went to was um, a wildlife park a few miles north of us. But I managed to get the uh, uh, kind of like backstage passes, so you can actually um, uh, see the animals close up, um, feed them, and scratch their fluffy heads. Um, and if all, each of the each staff member got uh, got to choose a different animal to see. Um, whenever there's uh, uh, a new Star Wars film comes up, we uh, drive to the next town where they've got this luxury screening theatre. Um, catch the film uh, the day before the, um, the the official official release. But uh, we've turned up early that day to work. We've um, had pancakes. We've watched. Um, the previous Star Wars film um, on the flat screen. We go up to the uh, cinema, come back, play Star Wars games, then go to uh, a restaurant in the evening to um, the, discuss the film and break it down. Um, and that's um, uh, that's the regular thing we do whenever there's uh, whenever there's a new Star Wars film. Hey, that's that sounds awesome. Wow, what a great place to work. Um, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, I, I wish. Uh, you know, other places where I worked uh, went on field trips like that and uh, had field trips <laughs> out. <laughs> Especially like, uh, you know, where I live is a lot of outdoor uh, sports and opportunities. And it'd be nice to just go out and walk in nature. Or uh, go, there's a uh, there's a hands-on science museum nearby that's pretty fun. Um, that'd be a great place to take employees. But it goes it goes um, both ways. I mean, if everyone's happy, they don't mind putting the, the work in. I mean, we left... Um... Uh, the office um, almost on time, a little after five. Um, uh, today. But um, uh, if people are working um, in the evenings or over the weekends, they don't necessarily see see it as um, uh, a bind. I mean, normally when your boss um, says you you have to work, um, there's a dark cloud forms over you. Um, but we never say that to people. It's something they um, do vol voluntarily, and it's because they want to, because they are invested in the work, um, and they know that um, uh, that they get all the um, fun stuff in return. And why would you want to move to another company uh, in that case? Um, it, it it does also help that they're paid quite well as well. <laughs> That's great. Employee loyalty. <laughs> it's nice to have. Um, so, yeah, let, uh, let's talk about uh, what you've been up to for this past year. I mean, COVID has been, like, looming over us and um, uh, things that we used to be able to do before, like go to gaming stores and conventions and stuff have been kind of out. Has that, um, on the other hand, people have been, I think, uh, well, from my observations, it seems like people are turning more to gaming, um, uh, either in small groups or, or by remote. Um, how how has your um, sales been affected? Gone up or down or stayed the same? Or how have you had to adjust? No, well, yeah, I mean, when when the um, virus came along, um, the UK government announced its first lockdown. Um, Mongoose was in lockdown, was it two or three weeks before the official date? Um, I had everyone working at home. Um, First thing we noticed was um, without all the distractions, the office productivity went up. 
um, which is why you saw a whole rash of books coming out um, at the uh, at the end of last year. Um, we do we did find that um, the more nebulous creative aspects were lost. I mean, the ability to just turn around to someone sitting next to you and say, "Hey, what do you think about this alien?" Um, I mean, you, you can do similar things through file transfers and um, Skype and what have you, but it's just not the same. Um, so while on a practical level, um, working from home um, really does work well for us. And we did talk about um, doing it on a permanent basis um, after the, uh, the lockdown's finished. Uh, on a creative level, it does raise some issues. So... Um, I think I think we're going to more or less return to office working um, uh, when when this when this madness is over. In terms of sales, um, when the world went into lockdown, um, it seemed that everyone and his dog immediately decided to get into Traveller and buy the core rule book, or if they already had the core rule book, buying a big expansion like um, the Pirates of Drenax campaign. Um, so whereas we had well over a year's worth, um, uh, a year's supply of the core rule book in our warehouse, um, two, two and a half months into the um, lockdown, uh, they were gone, flat gone, um, which caught us completely by surprise. So we immediately order a reprint for it. Um, but the virus is hitting printers, it's hitting international shipping, and for six, maybe seven months last year, we could not sell you a core rule book. Um, and that's one of the golden rules of um, being an RPG publisher. You never, ever run out of your core rule book. Um, but there was just nothing that we could do about that. It's um, only over the past few months that we've managed to get out all the rule books that everybody else ordered. Um, so, no, in, in short, uh, the main effect of the virus for us was that everyone started playing Traveller. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a uh, bright side, you know. Um, I'm glad to see uh, Traveller being uh, more widely uh, played, and I'm glad for your good fortune there. Um, amazing to sell out of all your back stock of books. <laughs> no, it was... Um, uh, it was an interesting situation. I mean, we had um, working monkeys who were very much aware um, that the rest of the world was not having a similar experience. Um, and uh, one of the people working there said to me, um, I know sales uh, are going well. Um, we've managed to keep our jobs. We've managed to get um, bonuses this year. I know people who um, have uh, lost their jobs and are in real straits right now, and you start getting um, uh, a bit of guilt there. You, you don't want to let your friends know how you're getting on because you know that you're doing better than um, uh, than they are. Um, so it's, it's, it is a bit of a, 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 a strange situation. Yes, uh, but thankfully uh, the... Uh vaccines out so hopefully this time next year we'll all be back to normal um i haven't gotten mine well, but my, my maybe, wife has <laughs> maybe we are maybe we will be well i'm crossing my fingers <laughs> uh I'm, I'm not happy with uh, how it is right now <laughs> i need my uh i mean i we've adjusted we're, we're gaming by remote now and thank you discord and um uh you know, it's it's working out all right, and actually, it gives you opportunities to play with people that you never would have played with. You know, I have um, I, I live in the Southwest uh, United States. I'm, I'm in New Mexico, and uh, I'm I'm in a rural state. Um, there's not a lot of uh, I do have I do have a local group, but aside from them, uh, there's not a lot of players. And so, being able to connect with people by uh, Discord has just been a great boon for me. I mean, uh, I've got players in Canada, players in Australia, players in Germany and England, and um, I just have this, I uh, found this weird time converter <laughs> thing on the internet, and uh, we managed to all synchronize and, uh, and play once a week. And, uh, um, you know, we've just been, uh, well, I'm taking a little break uh, to, to do this event and stuff, and um, 
but before that, our game's been running uh, two years on a regular basis via Discord. So I recommend it to anybody who um, can't find a regular a local game. Get on a player matching system and uh, uh, you know, find find traveler players or whatever you want to play and, uh, and and get some remote gaming in. Don't be isolated. <laughs> Even if you're like just virtually connected, it's better than nothing, right? Hey. So, um, what what um, big uh, product have you been um, producing? What are uh, like? Uh, do you have? You said you already you always have um, things going. You don't really work on deadlines, but uh, you must have like some big projects uh, in the works that are about ready to come out. You want to tell us about those? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, over the past year. Um, well, the beginning of um, last year, I uh, made this grand announcement at the time that you always end up regretting, saying that we have been promising certain titles um, for two or three years and they haven't come out. So we made the decision, right, um, uh, 2020 is going to be the year when these titles absolutely come out. So... Um, uh, so we did things like um, the two volumes of uh, Aliens of Charted Space, um, for example, uh, the Dranaxian Companion Shadows of Sindel books. We've been talking about for ages. We finally knuckled down and got them done. Um, but of course, as soon as those are done, we've always, already got um, uh, more titles on the way. The, uh, our Solomani front book came out on pre-order last week. That covers... Um, uh, two complete sectors, much in the same way that um, Behind the Claw did. But uh, right now, um, let's see, Cass is working on the Mercenary box set and expansion books that uh, recently got funded through um, uh, a new Kickstarter. Um, so that will bring a whole new pain type to uh, to Traveller. It's It has been kind of in the background through all the editions in the past, but this is the first time the actual structure of the campaign is um, properly quantified. Um, so you can, you roll up a bunch of characters and then um, uh, from that you will be able to, from their benefits, you'll be able to create um, a starting mercenary unit. Plus you have all the rules to pick up contracts and tickets and um, uh, of course fight with uh, larger units and so forth. Um, Sand, um, she finished off uh, Soleimani Rim and um, she's just about to finish off the first Soleimani adventure and she's just about to dive into the new 2300 AD uh, box set. Um, and we've just uh, yesterday actually brought on um, uh, a new graphic designer, uh, Katrina, who is... Today was uh, working on um, uh, just um, a combined pack that has a pad of um, carriage sheets and uh, blank subsector maps. Um, but she's going to be working on a string of adventures, um, including the very first one set in uh, Deneb sector, um, before moving on to some bigger projects, um, including... Um, uh, revision of the old Secrets of the Ancients uh, campaign that we did for our, our first edition. Um, but beyond that, 2300 ADs is going to be a very big project. That's uh, the box set and the first few supplements going to take up most of Sandrine's year. And we're looking to dive into the Fifth Frontier War at long last as well. Hey, that sounds good. Uh, 2300 AD is something um, I hadn't heard uh, that was going to be revived. Uh, that's a popular product. I hope so. It's always um, been kind of a little bit scary to people in the past. Um, if they didn't already know about it, there's always been a little bit of a barrier there um, trying to find out what it's what it's actually about and how it differs from Traveller. Um, this time around, we're um, looking to make it uh, a, a lot more welcoming, shall we say. I always thought it was, uh, well, I, I didn't think of this before now, but now I think of it kind of like, um, kind of like the expanse. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a, a great, um, great example. I mean, we're also based on things like, um, the old Sean Connery film outland, but, um, 
no, the, the presence of the Expanse TV series is really going to um, uh, help with 2300 um, in terms of um, understanding what it's about. Uh, a lot of people like to play that uh, pre-jump kind of um, high tech, but not no warp drives or no no faster yeah, no. than light travel. And I think that's going to uh, fit that too, niche. High tech. Yeah, yeah, that'll that'll fill that niche. That'll be great. Um, that's a that's a, another um, traveler thing I encountered in, along my path of following traveler editions. Um, if it had a traveler name on it, I pretty much have it in my memory. <laughs> um, Let's see. Uh, okay. Um, so, where can we get these uh, uh, products? You ha you maintain your own uh, store, uh, sort a virtual storefront. Well, as as I say, available in all good game stores. Okay. Um, they're carried by um, just about every uh, distributor in um, uh, North America and uh, Europe. So, if your store hasn't for some unknown reason, if your store hasn't got them on their shelves, have a word to them. They can order them from um, uh, distributors they're already using. Um, but they're also uh, available um, directly from us via our uh, website. Um, we ship all over the world. So we've got, um, I say we've got our HQ here in the UK, but we also have a warehouse in uh, North America to cover the US and Canada. Um, and if books aren't your thing, we have a full line of uh, digital editions as well. But again, both on our website and on drive through. Um, and if you order a book from our website, you'll get the PDF immediately for free. Oh, that's a great feature. A lot of people request request that. I've seen the questions about that on a lot of the forums. If I buy the hard copy, do I also get a uh, PDF edition? And that's a great way to deliver it right away. We do. Um, so if you see something go up on pre-order, um, you can pre-order the uh, the book and um, know you'll be getting it uh, within a few days of it um, uh, arriving in our warehouse. But you also get the uh, PDF immediately so you can uh, dive right in. Um, if you do pick up a book from your local store, if they're part of the Bits and Mortars program, you'll get a free PDF there as well. Hey, great. So let's say... Uh, let's say uh, things start to die down with as far as COVID. What's your plan for uh, coming back to normal? Uh, opening the office first thing, getting the local club back in for another. Um, and then we'll take a good long look at um, uh, which conventions start opening up first and um, uh, make a decision about which one of those we're going to uh, attend. Um, Dragon Meet in the UK is always um, uh, a good one uh, for us. Um, uh, and in America, it's been a few years now since we were at uh, Gencon, but um, uh, I feel after all these months in lockdown, the uh, uh, Mongoose staff deserve a trip to America. What do, what do you think? I think so too. Uh, do you ever, uh, so you've never gone to the Traveler Con here? Not to the Traveler Con, no. Um, but you're gonna hit. I mean, when, you're gonna hit a hit a bigger a bigger expos. Though. I mean, conventions. Well, we kind of have to because um, I mean, it's, um, uh, as well as the actual flight, it's, it's more than an eight-hour trip um, yeah. cooped up in a, a tiny box just to uh, get to America, um, and then um, you got all the hotel costs and whatever. Oh, yeah, right. All mount very quickly. So yeah. We, Plus, you yeah. probably want to make new yeah. traveler players, not necessarily revisit existing ones <laughs> at, a, at a bigger convention you can do both that's that's, that's not unfair um plus um, i must get around to it i haven't um uh, i've had many many long conversations with uh, mr miller but i've never actually met him in person oh that would um, be nice i think i think we're going to change that in the next year or two he's been super friendly uh to me and uh, i appreciate uh him being that way it's awesome so, uh, all right. Well, we've reached the end of the interview. Tell me uh, again, uh, what's the name? Uh, what's the name of your website? How can people find your website? Oh, the website's uh, simply mongoosepublishing.com. All right, and they can uh, find uh, Paranoia and Traveler and uh, Twenty Three Hundred AD all all there and more. Yep. Um, also, um, Sea of Thieves is our other game based on the. Um, 
uh, video game if you uh, fancy being a pirate. Ah, yes, I've seen that on uh, Steam, but I haven't played it yet. Um, and do you have uh, social media, like a Facebook uh, page or some other uh, way that people can connect with you on social yeah. media? Indeed, we're very active on um, uh, Facebook. You'll see a lot of um, uh, previews of um, uh, art material uh, on there. Um, we're on Twitter as well, although my Twitter foo is woefully lacking. Um, that's uh, put under the heading of must try harder this year. Um, and there are all sorts of uh, unofficial portals for travelers as well. There's um, uh, a Reddit page, there's uh, a Discord channel. Um, and we, we try to um, swing by each of those at least once a week and say hello. Great, great. Yes, I've seen you um, uh, making comments on Facebook and uh, around different places. Uh, I appreciate that, uh, that your company uh, does that outreach for the customers. It's, it's great. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you very much. Okay, that's the end of our interview. I'm your host, Frank Sucardi, also known as Cyborg Prime. And I've been talking with Mr. Matthew Sprange of Matt Mongoose Publishing. You can find the full line of Traveler products on his website, which is mongoosepublishing.com. And uh, Matthew, thank you so much for participating in this uh, third Mayday Mayday Traveler Day event. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. And thank you, dear listener, for joining us today. That's all for now, travelers. Until next time, happy traveling.